Welcome to Pell City First United Methodist Church and this expression of online worship. My name is Joe Riddle. I'm one of the associate pastors here at the church and we are so excited that you have chosen to worship with us today. As we begin this time together, I want to invite you to go and find a candle uh, if you don't have one there and light, uh, light a candle with me as we set aside this time to seek out the presence of God in our lives. One summer uh, during college, I had the opportunity to backpack throughout Europe. And as the trip uh, began, or as the trip was coming to a close, uh, I had pretty much spent most of my budget and so partly to save a little money uh, and also just to be kind of adventurous and fun I, I decided to sleep on the beach in Barcelona Spain so as evening approached that night I took my backpack and stored it in a locker uh, in the main train station in the city uh, I walked down to the beach got something for dinner and ate uh, that and pretty quickly realized I had made a grave mistake. All I had uh, left with me or on me were shorts and a t-shirt and this little uh, wallet that I could wear around my neck and I had you know, a passport and a little bit of cash. But it turns out that beaches in Barcelona are not the same as beaches on the Gulf Coast and there was this constant wind coming in off the water and it was freezing. I mean, it was cold at night in the middle of summer on the beach. So I, I tried to find a spot where I might be able to lay down and, and sleep a little, but it was just too cold. And so I ended up spending all night having to uh, get up and walk around, try to stay warm, and I would go back and forth between uh, sitting down because I was so tired and getting up and walking because I was so cold. I think it was probably close to two in the morning. Uh, I finally uh, noticed there were a group of people who were probably homeless or who were homeless uh, kind of gathered together under this kind of like a boardwalk area and I realized that under there it was a little bit warmer and that if you sat just right uh, to the side of these huge pillars you could actually block the wind coming off the water so I, I found me a spot uh, away from the group of of homeless people. Um, I didn't want to be too close, but still underneath and, and to the side of one of these pillars. And, and I sat down and found some relief from the wind. And I, I put my shirt over my knees, trying to stay warm. It, it, wasn't, soon, or it wasn't long before uh, the clubs and, and all the nightlife began shutting down. And so there was a, a whole stream of young people coming or going home from their night out. And as they walked by, I felt afraid. I, I was afraid they would think I was homeless and that they might try to hurt me or, or rob me or something. And at the same time, I felt alone and ignored, that no one would make eye contact with me. It was as if I wasn't even there. I just sat there with my shirt over my knees, freezing, and no one really cared. I thought about how any other day or night I would be these young people walking home from the club or, or the bar. About that time as I was kind of thinking through all this another guy who I had noticed um, he is also kind of by himself 
but he had all of his belongings with him there on the road, on the street. Uh, he came over to talk to me, and for some reason in that like spur of the moment, uh, I thought this is a great time to practice all of my Spanish that I learned in high school that I really didn't know. Uh, and so I said the, a few words that I did know in Spanish, and it just kind of set him off. Uh, I mean, in a good way. He, he thought I understood him, and so he just uh, really got to talking. And I didn't know anything he said, and instantly regretted that I had tried to pretend like I knew anything uh, of his language. And I started to be afraid again. Uh, finally, this man gave up and walked away and I saw or watched as he began asking other people who were coming from the bars and clubs and or talking to them and realized he was just asking for a cigarette so he went off and, and smoked it and I watched and then he came back over to me again and this time he was kind of leaning over me as I was sitting down and again in Spanish talking a lot and I didn't know what he was saying and again I began to feel afraid I just wanted him to leave me alone I really was worried he was uh, gonna try and rob me or, or again try and um, ask something of me uh, that he might want me to give him some money uh, it didn't really cross my mind at the time how I probably looked uh, homeless and uh, in need myself. Finally, he left, and I watched as this uh, man who I was afraid of walked over to all of his stuff and rummaged around, and he found the nastiest jacket that I've ever seen. And he dusted it off and he brought it to me and didn't even say a word but handed it to me. He didn't even try to get me to understand that I could borrow it or that he would want it back. He just gave it to me and walked off. I felt like the biggest jerk in the world. Just moments earlier I had, I mean, felt fear and angst from this man. I was scared because he was homeless and I had an idea of how homeless people were like. But instead of wanting something from me, he gave me his jacket. It wasn't long, uh, maybe 10 minutes, before the uh, city street sweeper came through that area spraying water everywhere and they didn't care. Uh, if I was in the way, if I got wet. So uh, I took the jacket off. I, the man was nowhere around. And I went and laid it back on his belongings and disappeared into the night. Our scripture today comes from 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 8 through 16. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go now to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and live there. For I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he set out and went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel, so that I may drink. As she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful, handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterwards make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of meal will not be emptied, 
and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, so that she as well as he and her household ate for many days. The jar of meal was not emptied, neither did the jug of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. My experience that night in Barcelona taught me a truth that I think is also being spoken in the scripture that we read today. And to really understand the story of Elijah and the widow, we have to zoom out a little bit. We, we need to know what else has happened before this because it changes how we see these characters. Elijah has just shown up on the scene as this uh, brand new prophet. And he has gone to King Ahab and told him there's going to be a long drought because Ahab is following his queen Jezebel's god, Baal. They believe Baal is responsible for fertility and rain. So Elijah tells them God is in control and you will see because of this drought. God then tells Elijah almost immediately uh, to run away and hide in the wilderness. It can be a little dangerous uh, to confront a king or, or someone in power. So Elijah is led to a stream where he can get water and is fed by ravens who bring him food. That's important for understanding the next part uh, of the story which we read today. Elijah could not have been very well kept. He was homeless, living in the wilderness, being fed by scavenger ravens, and he stays in this place until his stream dries up uh, because of this drought. That's when God tells him, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon. And there you'll find a widow who will take care of you. Now, Zarephath is a small town. It's in the same country that Jezebel came from. God is sending Elijah into the heart of where Baal is worshipped and to be fed by a widow. And guess what? Even there, God is in control. When Elijah gets there, he finds the widow at the town gates collecting sticks. She is clearly suffering from the effects of this drought. We're reminded that while Ahab and Jezebel sit uh, living their easy life in their nice house, living comfortably, the decisions they make as they lead Israel have some pretty far-reaching effects. Then, as today, the decisions of our leaders make, uh, make often are felt the most by those who already have the least, right? especially women and children throughout the world. And so God sends Elijah to this poor widow who we find out is very much in need of a miracle. And I think that God sent Elijah to this particular widow for a reason. I think God knew that this widow had an ability to see people. What am I talking about? If we look at this, this story again, a little closer from the widow's perspective, we hear this story and we think that she is the one with no power, that she's the one uh, that needs all the help. And it's true, right? She has decided that there's not enough food left for her uh, and her son. She decides she can make one more meal, and then they're just going to wait until hunger overtakes them and they die. She goes out to gather sticks to make a fire, and as she's gathering sticks, this strange man walks up and tells her to bring her some water. 
And, and when I say strange, I mean strange. Elijah has been living in the wilderness and is being, has been fed by ravens. What do you think he looked like? I mean, how many strangers who look like that are you going to listen to if they just walk up to you and tell you, go fetch me some water? I would be afraid if I were her. I'd be wondering who this guy thinks he is and probably kind of thinking he might just be a little bit off. I'd probably try to figure out how to get out of there. But that's not what she does, is it? She goes to get him some water. This widow is able to see a person in front of her. And even though she has some pretty severe needs herself, she can see that he has just as uh, much of a need, if maybe not more so. Of course, realizing that this widow must be the one who God had wanted him to interact with, to take care of him. Elijah assumes this widow can also bring him some bread. God had told him, she will take care of you, after all. She was Elijah's resource. But this is where the widow becomes more than a resource for Elijah too, becomes a person. She tells him that she only has enough for her and her son to have one last meal before they die of hunger. Elijah's eyes are opened and finally he tells her to not be afraid, that she should make something for him and her and her son and that her supplies will not run out. There will be enough. And the miracle happens. I think that God sent Elijah to this widow because she was someone who saw people. That's what allowed this miracle to happen. It would have been so easy for her to try and run away or uh, chase off this wild-looking, rude man asking for what she barely had enough of for herself. But she didn't because she saw a human being who was in need and decided she would help as much as she could. When she helped him, Elijah got to know more about her. Elijah had his eyes open to see her as a human being. And at that point, tells her to not be afraid. God will provide. Before, Elijah just saw a foreigner who was supposed to take care of him. He didn't know that she needed a miracle, too. Otherwise, I think he would have started out by saying, don't be afraid, help is on the way. Maybe he was thirsty and hungry. His river had dried up after all. Maybe he was hangry and just wanted to, uh, someone to give him what he needed. But when he takes the time to hear her story, Something changes in the way he acts towards her, and he's then able to help to provide for her needs too. These miracles happen because they took the time to see one another. Jesus' miracles happen because he took the time to see the people around him in need. I was given a jacket that night in Barcelona because... That man who was homeless took the time to see me as a person. When everyone else walked by and felt that they didn't have enough to share with me, he stopped. He talked to me. He gave me what little he had because he saw a person in need. If you want to see a miracle, take the time to stop and really see someone. Get to know them. You'll find that God is working in their lives. 
I believe we could see a lot more miracles in this world if we would just take the time to see one another. God has already provided. God has, has provided more than enough for all of humanity. But we don't take the time to see people. Our leaders don't take the time to see the people who their policies and decisions truly affect. Most of the time, we rarely take the time to see people who are in need around us, to really get to know individuals, to form relationships with people that last, people that have their ups and downs, but whose story is most likely more like ours than we could even imagine. Just trying to make it. Loves and lost loves, lucky breaks, and can't catch a break, big questions, life. Often we we don't even take the time to recognize people in the ways we talk about others. We, We say illegals, or the homeless, or the blacks, or the Jews, the convicts, the Africans. We don't refer to others as people. And then it's easier for us to dismiss their cries for justice and mercy. It's easier for us to not see them as people. And then we don't have to make the choice to enter into a relationship with them and and be a part of their miracle. We can just group them all together and assume that one is the same as the next. This kind of thing can happen in any relationship. You know, it can happen when we start to think of our spouses as just our, our wife or our husband. We take them for granted. We never forget that we are people, but sometimes we forget everyone else is also a person who, who also have complex emotions and, and stresses, and they change their minds sometimes. And They need love and want love and sometimes do really dumb stuff to try and act out to get that love or sometimes become blinded and misled by fear. And so we forget others are people with needs and thoughts and emotions and and only care for ourselves, thinking others should and can just give to us. Thank God that the widow didn't just assume Elijah was another homeless man. Thank God that Elijah didn't assume that the widow was just another poor foreigner with no heart. Thank God that man who was homeless in Barcelona didn't just think I was some lazy bum who should work for my own jacket. Help us, God, to have eyes like yours, eyes that see our brothers and sisters all around us and all around the world as people, as individuals in need of your love and your grace. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for everyday miracles. God, we give you thanks when needs are met, ours and all those around us, God. We're reminded uh, of the prayer that you taught us to pray. Uh, Give us this day our daily bread and, and all the needs that we ask that you meet God, we we recognize that you have provided so much, enough for all people. God, open our eyes to see the injustices and the places where uh, some of us have taken more than we need or we are parts of system that keep resources and food away from those who are hungry. God, give us eyes to see the people around us, people who are different from us, people who think differently, who look differently. God, help us to overcome 
the, the human fear that we, we all know. Help us to, to overcome that and, and instead take the first step to, to reach out and get to know someone different than us, Lord. Pray that you would be with each one of us. God, we pray that you would be with our leaders as well, that you would open their eyes to see all the ways that the decisions they make uh, impact so many people here in our community and around the world. God, soften their hearts. God, this morning we, we pray especially for people in Ukraine. We ask that you would bring peace uh, to their country. That those in power there could see how devastating their decisions are right now. Lord, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. We, we pray that you would help us to love you and love others in all we do. And we pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you, in you in me? Will you love the you you hide if I but call your name? Will you quell the fear inside and never be the same? Will you use the faith you've found to reshape the world around? Through my sight and touch and sound in you, in you. your summons echoes true in you but call my name let me turn and follow you and never be the same in your company I'll go where your love and footsteps show thus I'll move and live and grow 